carrying us into the future one second after another and on and on and on and uh, this is a time machine too designed by writer H.G. Wells to transport us to a very frightening future and for a magic ride into a happier past there's this time machine over here something very top secret something built today to recapture yesterday or explore tomorrow whichever you choose Is there really such thing as a time machine we can just hop into, roar off through the cosmic calendar in any direction? No. Well, not yet. Maybe next year. Maybe in a thousand years. No one knows. But what if we had one? Right here and now. Just imagine all the amazing things that are waiting for us out there between all the ticks and talks of time. Michael J. Fox. For the next 124th of a day, for the next 3,600 seconds, for the next 60 minutes, for the next exciting hour, you and I are going to go time traveling together. We'll turn the pages of some timeless literature, and we'll relive some famous clock-stopping moments from the movies, too. In the hour ahead, we'll examine what time is, how we measure it, and why a genius named Albert Einstein changed our whole concept of it. Everyone looks up to Einstein and no one understands him. We'll talk time travel with science fiction writers like Ray Bradbury and Robert Silverberg. A small change in the past might have colossal consequences in the future. Before we're done, we'll travel near the speed of light to slow time down and plunge into the theory that black holes in space might be used as gateways to other universes and other times. There's nothing in the theory to tell us that, that we couldn't, in fact, then travel in time. That's what that space and time inside the black hole does. It provides trips, if you like, to, to funny places. You meet Dr. Edwin Krupp from the Griffith Observatory and astronomer Carl Sagan and the imaginative movie makers behind the newest time-traveling science fantasy action comedy adventure Back to the Future. Executive producer Steven Spielberg and director Robert Zemeckis. I hope they don't think it's a movie about clocks. It'll be a movie about time. Well, the last, what was the last clock movie that made a profit? I don't know. <laughs> and who knows? We might just have enough time left after all that to sneak a peek at what's really under here. Sound interesting? The trouble with everyday time is it only goes one way, toward the future. I'm kind of slow at that. Bad news for anyone who's itching to get moving and travel to where we're headed, or to where we've been. If only there were a machine that could kick the clock into high gear. If only there were a couple of knobs to turn or buttons to push so we could speed up time in any direction we wanted. Anything wrong with a Wayback Machine, Mr. Peabody? Merely changing the fan belt, Sherman. I guess we won't be going back into history then, huh? Oh, on the contrary, my boy, we're all set to invade the city of Paris in the year 1874. With all due respect to Mr. Peabody and Sherman fans, a clever dog was not the first genius to create a time machine. That distinction belongs to a clever man, H.G. Wells, the famous British writer, 
Way back in the 1890s, Wells' short story, The Time Machine, sparked the imagination of readers, and other writers, too. H.G. Wells is, I'm, I'm certain, the, the true father of modern science fiction. I, I think if H.G. Wells hadn't existed, uh, one heck of a lot of other time machines would never have been invented. Oh, it's beautiful. Remarkable. Very nice, Joe. Fascinating. What is it? This is only a small experimental model, of course. To carry a man, a larger edition is needed. To carry a man? Where? Into the past or into the future? This is a time machine. In the story, Wells' hero is surrounded by friends who refuse to believe he's invented a time machine. They think he's kidding, or just plain crazy. Even though he sends a test model into the future right before their very eyes. What amazing places does H.G. Wells take us to in his machine? You'll see for yourself a little later on. But before we time travel anywhere, we've got to understand what time is. No, 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 that's not as easy or as obvious as it sounds. Time is all around us, every second of every day. We literally live our lives by it. And yet we can't see it, we can't touch it, and truth be known, we can't even comprehend it, except in the simplest symbolic terms. We speak of time as though it's something real, the, the kind of thing that, that you can package and, and promote and, and put out in, in some kind of physical way. But in fact, time is really an abstraction. It's a concept. It's an idea that our brains use in order to do something much more fundamental, and that is deal with the real things that confront us. Those are events. It's events that we find happening around us, and we organize those events in sequence according to a principle that we happen to call time. When I speak of time, gentlemen, I'm referring to the fourth dimension. If you don't mind, George, would you refresh me on the, on the first three dimensions? Suppose you explain it, Doctor. Huh? Oh, certainly. <laughs> well... For example, when I move in a straight line, uh, forward or backward, that's one dimension. And when I move to the left or right, two dimensions. And when I move up or down, three dimensions. Yes, but what is the fourth dimension? Mm, oh, well, that's it. Oh, that's mere theory. No one really knows what the fourth dimension is or even that it exists. If time truly is the unseen fourth dimension, then when did it begin? Many scientists say time started with the Big Bang the awesome explosion that created the universe billions of years ago. That's a lot of history to look back on, which is exactly what we do when we gaze into the nighttime sky. Everything we see up there is a delayed image from the past. It takes a second for light to go 186,000 miles. So clearly it takes light some time to get here from anywhere. The farther away things are, in fact, we're looking farther back in time. So, uh, like the Andromeda Galaxy, we're seeing that as it looked two million years ago. We see the sun as it looked eight minutes ago, and the moon about a second and a third ago. So an instantaneous view that we have of the entire universe of the nighttime sky is really a collection of all of these objects at once, all at different distances, and therefore all at different times. What is time? What is time? Time, as the man said, is what keeps everything from happening all at once. Okay, so the concept of what time is can really be a mind blower and no one can truly define or describe it. But measuring time, well, that's another story. Although it did take us thousands of years to get our timekeeping act together. It's a good thing we did too. Without clocks, without watches, we couldn't have evolved at all. We, uh, we would collide with each other. If man had no timekeeping, everything would happen all at once. We'd plant crops in the middle of the, the dry season, and we'd go hungry, and we would have all died out somewhere about a million and a half years ago. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Okay. 
in the future, an infinitely advanced time tourist might be able to make enough of it to stretch a wormhole big enough and hold it open long enough to make a safe journey into the past. With negative energy real in practice and wormholes real in theory, Thorne took the plunge and went public. My concern was the word time machine in the title and my worry was that the popular press would see this paper and would start to ballyhoo it in a manner that uh, caused our uh, serious scientific colleagues to pay no attention to it as being crackpot stuff. Very quickly, the rest of the press uh, grabbed hold of it. Here we are, we've invented time travel. There are other stories that basically had us building time machines in our own basements. And uh, I, I rather quickly pulled back and told the Caltech Public Relations Office, I do not give interviews on this subject. I uh, told uh, uh, my research group's administrative assistant, uh, I do not return telephone calls from the press on this subject. Uh, I will talk about anything else but not time travel. <laughs> But Thorne's work brought other scientists out into the open. When I realized that my friend and extremely great scientist, Kip Thorne, published it, I immediately called him and told, thank you so much for that. Now I will publish, I will work on, on this uh, subject also. He was overjoyed. On the other end of the phone, he said, oh, Kip, it's absolutely wonderful. Your paper's wonderful. You've broken the barrier. If you can do research about time travel, then so can I. Igor Novikov had been working on time travel in secret for years. He was interested in the trouble that time travelers might cause if they went back and tried to change history. Once it appeared that time machines were a real possibility, we then had to face the question of paradoxes, of going back in time and changing history, and thereby uh, causing the foundations of physics to crumble beneath us. The grandfather paradox is a uh, very simple science fiction based apparent inconsistency at the very heart of the uh, idea of backwards time travel. That cannonball that knocked my grandfather unconscious in the Civil War battle so he lay there three days before he came back. Suppose that I had deflected the cannon slightly and he had really been killed. Where does that then leave you? How do I be get here? Do you instantly pop out of existence because you were never made? But then you couldn't have gone back and so on. Paradoxes with time travel without getting into the nasty business of free will of human beings. If I don't have a uh, time machine at all, then billiard ball physics is very simple and very clear. If I have a time machine, the story is quite different. In this case, I have only one billiard ball. And I send that billiard ball into this mouth of the uh, wormhole, and it will then come out of that mouth before it entered this mouth hit itself and prevent itself from going into the first mouth, voila, a paradox. It's the billiard ball version of go back and kill my father before I'm conceived. Of course, this problem was discussed a lot uh, in literature, in movies, in uh, science fictions. But I'm talking not about fantasies, but real science. In searching for a resolution of the paradox, we were led by a principle introduced by Igor Novikov, which said that nature will only allow those behaviors that are absolutely self-consistent. So the question then was, can you find a solution of the equations where this ball maybe hits itself but does not produce any self-inconsistency? If a ball emerged in the past, it would have to knock its earlier self into the time machine so that it's there to come out again, and knock itself back in again, and so on. Only then could its behavior be self-consistent. Novikov approached the equations from all angles, and every time only the self-consistent solutions worked out. This is the main principle. All these events must be in self-consistency with each other. It's so simple, so obvious, but more of that. 
we gave the strict mathematical proof that this principle is the consequence of the basic ideas of the physics. By the same token, any attempt a time traveller might make to rewrite history would be thwarted. Yes? I'm here to prepare your room, my love. What has happened has happened. It cannot be changed. It cannot be repeated twice in different ways. Human beings aren't billiard balls and we might like to believe in free will. So a sufficiently stubborn human would seem to be able to get around any sort of consistency condition by just demanding that he does something different. I can have a free will to walk along this wall without special equipment. It's my free will. Can I do that? No, I can't. Why? Because of a law of physics, because of the law of gravity. It's forbidden. Gravity means you can't walk up a wall. So gravity already restrains our free will. And if time travel ever does become possible, other laws of physics would stop a traveller from changing the past. Interesco, open up, please. Immediately. Immediately now, at this job. Do you open up the door? Immediately. Those determined to change history might try to send a message backwards in time. But to do that, we'd have to send information faster than light. And this man reckons he can send a signal faster than light into the realm where Einstein said time would run backwards. This signal is split into, by an electronic mirror here, into two parts. So we can compare the signal one is moving through the air, and the other one is moving through the barrier. Yes. Gunter Nimtz splits a microwave signal. The half that goes through the air travels at the speed of light and is displayed on an oscilloscope. The half that hits the barrier should go nowhere, but that's not what seems to happen. This is an oscilloscope where you see the signal, and then we can see which one is faster. The two humps on the screen are not in the same place, because one signal got there faster than the other, and the faster one tunneled through the barrier. Only a very small part comes to the other side, but it comes, and this part comes at a velocity which is much faster than the velocity of light. Nimtz believes that the faster signal uses a strange effect called quantum tunneling to get past the barrier. Tunneling depends on the fact that down at the quantum level, where particles are a lot smaller than atoms, the world is a totally random place. When a particle like a photon is here, it also has a small but very real chance of being here, or here, or here, at the other end of the barrier. What Nimtz and his team did was to pick up the photons that appeared at the far end, and then to measure how fast they got there. <laughs> I'm amused about this. We did this for fun. And when we figured out that it's faster than the velocity of light, we did not think about its importance. The leader in this field, Raymond Chow, has misgivings about Nimtz's interpretations but even he agrees with part of what Nimtz is saying. In our experiments, we have uh, measured uh, that a single photon can tunnel across a tunnel barrier at 1.7 times the speed of light. Right or wrong, this leads to an interesting thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment in German. What if you could tunnel a message to the other side of the universe? Going faster than light, the message would seem to go backwards in time. 
I came across a nice Gedanken experiment. There's a signal going to a far star, which is the information that you were born. And 20 years later, tunnel the signal at your age of 20 years, and this will arrive before the signal comes to the star that you were born. Yes, if we had a tunnel barrier that was, uh, say, uh, very wide from here to the next galaxy, then in principle, yes, you could then, uh, in the tunnel effect, advance the wave uh, so much so that uh, it, it, uh, it begins to worry me that uh, we have sent something really fast in the speed of light. I consist, no, no, I not consist, I insist on it that we have and we can transmit signals faster than the velocity of light. Perhaps one day our infinitely advanced grandchildren will send messages back through time, or even use wormholes to travel back comfortably themselves. But that leaves one big question. Time travel might be possible, but if that is the case, why haven't we been overrun by tourists from the future? This argument I find very dubious. It might be that time travel into the past is possible, but they haven't gotten to our time yet. They're very far in the future, and it's the further back in time you go, the more expensive it is. Then there's a the possibility that they're here, all right, but we don't see them. They have perfect invisibility cloaks or something. If, if they're so smart, if they have such highly developed technology, then why not? Then there's the possibility that they're here and we do see them, but we call them something else, UFOs or uh, ghosts or... I think that if people from the future were going to show themselves, they would do so in a more obvious way. What would be the point of revealing themselves only to cranks and weirdos who wouldn't be believed? But physics does put a limit on how far back any time tourist could ever travel. Relativity theory says in general that uh, once you've made a time machine, you can never use it to go backward in time before the uh, period when it was made. Whatever else is allowed, relativity is firm on this. We can't go back because no one has yet built a time machine. You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. Inside the machine, a space traveler would sit in what looked like an ordinary armchair. In the movie of Contact, the chair went high tech, but the idea was the same. A mysterious machine designed by aliens that would transport a human across the universe. But in writing this story, Sagan ran into trouble. Our galaxy is so large that it would take his heroine thousands of years to reach her destination. That was my problem, to get her to a great distance away from the Earth in the Milky Way galaxy to meet the extraterrestrials and come back and do all that within the lifetime of the people she has left behind. What Sagan needed was a shortcut through the vast reaches of outer space. And this search would unravel the secrets of time travel. In the early 1980s, there was a uh, common misunderstanding that you might be able to uh, travel from one place to the other in the galaxy without covering the intervening distance by plunging into a black hole. But there was something about the whole idea that made me nervous. And it was for that reason that I contacted Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne was an old friend and an expert on black holes. I was a little upset because he had the heroine in his novel traveling through a black hole, and I knew that you can't go into a black hole and come out somewhere else. The fundamental laws of physics forbid it. A black hole forms when a large star dies and collapses to a small, infinitely dense point with immense gravitational pull. This warps space so severely 
that everything nearby is sucked in and destroyed, making travel through a black hole impossible. If you go down through the horizon of a black hole, at the center you don't find a tunnel that leads you to some other place in the universe. What you find instead is a region where the material of which your body is made, the atoms get stretched and squeezed beyond recognition. And then space and time themselves get stretched and squeezed beyond recognition and destroyed. But if you've gone inside a black hole trying to travel through it, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, you're dead. <laughs> you, there was no way you could get through. I got back a uh, long letter from Kip with about 50 lines of closely reasoned equations, which uh, was a uh, level of detail in response to my phone call that I had not anticipated. Rather quickly, I recognized that what he uh, probably should do is replace the black hole as a means for rapid interstellar travel with a wormhole. At that time, wormholes were not something that were part of science fiction. They became part of science fiction as a result of this interaction between Carl and me. Wormholes are like tunnels in the fabric of space and time predicted by Einstein's equations. Thorne realized they might hold the answer to Sagan's dilemma. Our universe, it's three-dimensional, but we can pretend it's two-dimensional, so it's like this sheet of paper. And uh, we uh, live in Pasadena uh, over here, and London is over there, and it's thousands of miles from uh, Pasadena to London. This universe is curved up so that through hyperspace, the distance from Pasadena to London is only a few feet. And there is this pipe, this little wormhole, that will lead us from Pasadena to London across that very short distance. And it's like looking through a crystal ball. You see a distorted picture of what is going on at the other mouth of the wormhole, which may be in, the, uh, in another galaxy, or it may be near the Star of Vega, or it may be in London. This shortcut was just what Sagan's heroine needed. Gone through a wormhole. Contact had started something new. It introduced uh, to the world to science fiction and also uh, reintroduced uh, to uh, serious scientists the notion of a wormhole as something that is, was really worthy of thinking about. With wormholes on center stage, Thorne soon found they had other mysterious properties. They could be used for more than traveling great distances in space. They might also be used for time travel. If you have a wormhole, then you can turn them into time machines for going backward in time. We thought, how could we have been so stupid? We should have realized that. That's obvious. What became obvious to Thorne was that time could behave in strange ways inside a wormhole. Let's suppose that I have a wormhole with one mouth here and the other mouth over there. Now, there are three different possibilities for how time could be hooked up through the interior of that wormhole. The first is that when I stick my arm into this mouth, it came out over there simultaneously. The second possibility is that uh, when I stick my arm into this mouth, it comes out over there only after some delay. And the third possibility is that if I go into this uh, wormhole mouth, then I come out over there before I ever even go in. Let's just see that. It was quite a surprise when I realized that with a single wormhole, you could have time hook up uh, toward the future or toward the past, and that you could actually manipulate the wormhole and change how time hooked up. That was a surprise, but a very satisfying surprise when I really understood how it worked. Suddenly, time travel seemed feasible, at least in theory. As a youngster who was fascinated by the possibility of time travel in science fiction, to be in any way involved in, in possible actualization of time travel is, it just brings goosebumps. 
A physicist working on the possibility of travel into the past has to be careful not to be labeled a crank or accused of wasting public money on science fiction fantasy. Doc? Don't say a word. Stand back in less than three minutes! I shall have escaped this age of madness! <laughs> Nevertheless, it is an important question. Right now, we are in one of those uh, classic, wonderfully evocative moments in science. When we don't know, when there are uh, those on both sides of the debate, and when what is at stake is, uh, is very mystifying, very profound.